The America's Democrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, is made possible by contributions from our listeners. Want to do more? Go to America's Democrats.org and click donate. And thank you for allowing us to be your voice. This is America's Democrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand up Democrats. I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. Longtime CIA watcher John Prados answers the question of why so much information is classified when everyone knows it already. Richard Clark was the Bush administration official who foresaw 9 11 but was not heeded. We have an encore presentation about his new book about the Cassandra syndrome. And Joe Cerincioni of the Plowshares Fund talks with Bill Press about Trump's potential to start new wars. Had enough of Fox News, the House Freedom Caucus, and Donald Trump? If you want the facts that you won't get from them or from the fake news sites of the alt-right, then stay tuned. Our sponsor, 21st Century Democrats, works hard to get everyday Democrats involved in returning our party to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Sit back and listen, then stand up and fight, and follow 21st Century Democrats on Facebook for all the latest progressive news. We're glad you can join us. Intelligence watcher John Prado says the CIA is in danger of failing the country unless it becomes accountable for its product. And we say hello to John Prado, an author and analyst of national security issues based in Washington. He is the author of more than 20 books, including his new one, Ghosts of Langley, Into the CIA's Heart of Darkness. John Prado, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. And our pleasure to have you with us. Uh, what is the proper role of the CIA according to law? I mean, isn't it supposed to just collect and analyze data that helps a president create foreign policy? Well, yes, in theory, but uh, no in practice. Um, the original legislation that created the Central Intelligence Agency was the National Security Act of 1947. And under that act, uh, the situation that you just described prevailed. That is, the CIA was supposed to analyze information collected in behalf of the United States by U.S. intelligence agencies. And um, two things are important about that original language, one being that actually it didn't even provide for collecting information. The espionage side of CIA is as much an addition to the agency as the covert operations side. But anyway, uh, and in the middle of the drafting, uh, another clause was tacked on that the agency should do such other things related to intelligence as the president might from time to time direct. That was the uh, door in the barn that both the espionage and the covert operations drove through. Now, the espionage was very logical and soon became uh, a focus of a whole side of the CIA. The covert operations, were, they developed sort of more willy-nilly. The big thing in the early Cold War was what they called psychological warfare, and the big concern was that the United States had no mechanism for conducting psychological warfare. So the Truman administration uh, created another entity, something called the um, Office for Policy Coordination, the purpose for which was precisely to carry out psychological warfare. Psychological warfare soon became... Uh, eclipsed by covert operations, which started out as just a small slice of the psychological warfare pie. And then, of course, you had the political, bureaucratic kind of mishmash that always involves large organizations, wherein the CIA was... Uh, standing on one side while this OPC operation carried out much the same kind of work that the CIA was doing in collecting intelligence. But those guys were the new guys on the block. They were not the professionals. They were getting paid more money than the CIA. You can imagine the kinds of arguments that went back and forth and resolving this bureaucratic mismatch about how many intelligence guys there should be on the block went on for several years until finally in 1952 the guy who directed the CIA at that time, General Walter Bedell Smith, just pulled 
the OPC unit back into the CIA, said he was in charge of the whole thing. Come fight me if you want to say something about it. And covert operations have been inside the CIA ever since. This, by the way, despite the fact that the general counsel of the Central Intelligence Agency wrote an official legal uh, memorandum back in 1947, which said that CIA had no authority or authorization to carry out covert operations. The CIA has a long history of failing to anticipate major events in the world. Was it too busy conducting covert operations to take seriously its role in collecting intelligence? Um, that's, a, that's a hard question. I would say that uh, I, would, I would answer that either way, actually. Uh, in one sense, no, because the CIA developed a specialized uh, apparatus for creating intelligence analyses and carrying out intelligence analyses and has consistently through the years uh, refined those methods and attempted to tweak them even further in the direction of yielding insightful intelligence. On the other hand, um, the covert operators have uh, uh, had um, a history of not paying attention to the intelligence analysis uh, when the CIA was carrying out covert operations. So, for example, uh, at the time of the Bay of Pigs invasion of Cuba, you know, there were CIA intelligence analyses of how strong was the Cuban military and how they were beginning to import Soviet weapons. But the covert operators went ahead with a plan that hardly took that into account. You know, the idea that uh, 1,200 or 1,400 exiled Cubans, however well-armed, were going to overthrow Castro and his 200,000-man militia was uh, not well calculated. Let's put it that way. So uh, there is a, a, a continuing, um, how shall I say, disparity, a continuing dilemma between the two different arms of the CIA, what attention they pay to each other and um, uh, how effective they are. I can carry that forward in history with examples from the war against Cuba or, in fact, uh, the wars in Afghanistan and, and Iraq. And in each one of these wars, things like that have happened. Did the CIA miss North Korea's nuclear capability? Um well, let me go back and talk about failing to anticipate major events in a larger, broader sense, because North Korea's nuclear capability is one of these. You know, this is a classic example of a long-term intelligence issue that you follow. And that's uh, a term of art in intelligence, you know. You follow a subject, right? So... Uh, the epistemological sense of that is you're behind the subject. But in truth, it has an intelligence component because what you can see and observe about the thing that you're following determines the limit of what you can say about it with confidence. And the things that you say beyond that are where you enter the so-called estimative uh, arena where you're predicting rather than uh, uh, commenting on facts. And the question of predicting and the question of what is observable, those are the key things really in appreciating whether there's a surprise in terms of uh, what happens in a major event in the world. And North Korea's military and nuclear capabilities, you know, They've been watching the growth of the rockets, and they've been looking at the North Koreans carry out atomic tests. So I would say that their, uh, their uh, set of observables is probably as good as you can get. The question becomes, how do you anticipate Kim Jong-un's intentions? That's a more difficult thing. And... Um, to what degree is what North Korea is carrying out 
actually a deception or not. Again, another more difficult thing. Those two things are where the North Korean intelligence falls short, but the question becomes, are those two things predictable? And I would argue that they're not. Mm -hmm. So my analysis there is that with North Korea, our intelligence guys are in uh, uh, uncharted waters. We're speaking with John Prados, analyst of national security issues based in Washington, also the author of more than 20 books, including his new one, Ghost of Langley, the Into the CIA's Heart of Darkness. John, one of your concerns in the book is that the CIA has broken free from congressional oversight. Was the selection of a congressman, Mike Pompeo, good for the agency or is that just for Trump? Uh, there's probably levels of analysis to answer that question. On one level... It's good for the agency because Pompeo is a man of the Congress, and the Congress is a place where the CIA is in trouble right now. Uh, so uh, he can help them because he's familiar with his old haunts and whatnot. Um, but on the other hand, Mr. Pompeo, uh, however smart and however much of a quick study he is, uh, is not someone who is an intelligence professional or even has much um, historical knowledge of uh, where the bodies are buried in the intelligence world. So he's operating at a distinct disadvantage there. Now, my understanding is that he's gotten some good uh, uh, connections inside the agency, so he's popular at the moment. But my very clear sense is that Pompeo marches to Trump, not to the CIA. So uh, this sort of honeymoon period is going to go on just so long as uh, it's going to go on until the day that Mr. Trump begins making demands that are outrageous that CIA officers are reluctant uh, to carry out. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I believe also that the agency is on its way to, to get into trouble sooner or later because there's too much for an, uh, a manager to take care of, and there's no safety net from the congressional and traditional methods of accountability. So uh, the moment when the agency stumbles, the advantage of having Pompeo will disappear. You know, presidents of both parties go nuts about leaked information from whatever agency of government. So the question is, why is so much stuff classified in the first place, especially things people know, you know, after you've seen it on the news? That's a very good question. And as a matter of fact, uh, the New York Times of today, and today is uh, what now? September the 7th, 2017, contains a front page story that reveals the names of six CIA officers killed in the line of action in Iraq and Afghanistan. And I mention this only because uh, for years and years it has been an article of faith within the intelligence community and the CIA especially that uh, uh, officers who fell in the line of duty, their names must, must, must remain forever classified, can never be revealed to the world. They are represented by un named stars on a wall inside CIA headquarters, and so forth. Here you have a clear example of a leak, today's leak, and there are often leaks, so this is just today's leak. Um, and it's a good illustration of the fallacy of this whole argument about leaking, because leaks are played, you know, and it's a card you play from all sides. And it's clear to me that the leak I see in the newspaper today is one that was played from a high level in the United States government. And it was played for the purpose of uh, uh, asserting a heroic role for the Central Intelligence Agency, a way to build some measure of public confidence in the intelligence uh, community and uh, for no reason other than that. So uh, to a great degree, um, the outrage about leaking depends on the purpose of the leak and whose leak it was. And that's where we get to the question of the whistleblower. 
You know, some of these leaks are legitimately from people who are disturbed at the things that are going on around them that seem to be unauthorized or wrongheaded or uh, uh, wasting taxpayer dollars or any other number of considerations. And those people who leak those things become whistleblowers. The most recent obvious case is um, our NSA whistleblower, Snowden, who uh, revealed actual uh, um, uh, in, uh, transgressions against the constitutional rights of citizens. There's been a lot of heat about, you know, should he be punished, should he be rewarded for what he did, but what he did was in the interest of American democracy. I'm not so sure that it was in the interest of American democracy to leak the names of six CIA officers killed in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is a good question, and it will remain one. Is the CIA equipped or even interested in the non-military threats to the country, such as world poverty, climate change, resource shortages? Well, that's another good question. They used to be, and there's some, um, uh, how shall I say, some sense among agency analysts in particular that uh, these are things that need to be paid attention to. I think there was a, a more um, systematic effort to do some of this when George Tenet was the director of Central Intelligence back in the early aughts and the late Clinton administration. The, at that time, the agency was actually producing top-level reports on you know, what the world will look like in 2015 was one of them. And then 2025, I think before Tenet left, they probably had uh, 2035 type of uh, report underway. And I know that they did reporting on um, uh, population growth and on water, fresh water distribution. So they were paying some attention to some of these things because, you know, the question of whether you have water from the Jordan River or not, for example, could make a difference on whether Jordan or Syria attacks Israel or vice versa. You know, uh, uh, resources questions and raw materials questions, the world poverty questions, climate change now in particular, where we're starting to talk about climate change refugees. Um, those things can have a real impact on international relations, and it's part of the remit of an intelligence agency to pay attention to them. From what I can see, though, uh, the CIA is not moving in the direction of being able to do that. Um, their top-level analytical uh, unit has been absorbed by the director of central intelligence, so it no longer works for the CIA director. And uh, their main organizational thrust at this point is creating these mission centers which are operationally oriented. Uh, things like non-proliferation or geographical targets like Iran or North Korea, those kinds of things. And those kinds of things are going to keep their analysts busy on stuff that isn't, you know, what are the implications of global population trends. So I think the CIA is, is challenged to do this kind of work today. John Prados, analyst of national security issues based in Washington, author of more than 20 books, including his new one, Ghosts of Langley, Into the CIA's Heart of Darkness, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. John, we appreciate your time very much and look forward to having you back again soon. Great. Be glad to come. Thank you very much. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. <laughs> We want you to sit back and listen to this AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats. But we need you to stand up and fight. Do you want to get involved and help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box? You can make your contribution to help us keep this show going and to elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. Security measure. I believe that we must pass legislation to provide medical care. 
This is our tradition. When our grandparents came to America, it was the Democratic Party which said, Welcome. It was the Democratic Party, the party of Roosevelt and Truman and Kennedy and others, who said that America belonged to all its people, not just a handful of the rich or a few giant corporations. That's why great leaders like FDR fought so hard for Social Security and why JFK stood up to the insurance companies and their Republican allies to get Medicare. It's not just one thing or one time in one place. It's about a whole history of standing up to the Republicans and saying someone has to be on the side of regular working people in America, whether it's defending Social Security or just the way your loved ones are treated on the job. That's what the Democratic Party is all about. And that's why this message has been brought to you by the Democratic Party. Working people like you and me. Paid for by 21st Century Democrats. Not authorized by any candidate or candidate's committee. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. Richard Clark, an intelligence analyst for multiple administrations, has written a book about why top leaders don't listen to predictions. The short answer is, they don't think they can possibly be true. We'll talk to him about that in just a moment. Right now, we turn to Jim Hightower, America's number one populist, for his common sense commentary. So President Trump makes what was to be a condolence phone call to a young widow of Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, one of four American soldiers killed on a military patrol in Niger. And all of a sudden, the White House explodes in yet another political conflagration and a new burst of presidential lies. Was Trump disrespectful to the widow by not referring to her dead husband by name, but as your guy? then declaring that Sergeant Johnson, quote, knew what he was signing up for. She and two witnesses to the call say yes. Trump and his White House PR flax issued a furious string of no. But rather than simply let it go at no, Trump couldn't resist, one, patting himself on the back, and two, politicizing the whole exchange. He bragged that he has called the family of every soldier killed since he's been commander-in-chief. Turns out the chief lied about that. Many grieving families got no call at all from him. Then he took a cheap shot at Obama and other former presidents, declaring that most of them didn't call any families of dead soldiers. Another lie, for they did, in fact, make calls. But wait a minute. Niger? While most media outlets have played this brouhaha as a she-said-he-said story, shouldn't we be asking Trump the big question? What the hell are our military forces doing in Niger? To the public's complete surprise, we suddenly learn that the U.S. has soldiers dying there. Why? What is our national interest there that warrants spending American lives and money? This is Jim Hightower saying, Trump and his GOP Congress are throwing money at the Pentagon, your and my money, demanding a massive $700 billion military budget. For what? Here's another shocker for you. The Pentagon has some 200,000 U.S. troops deployed in 177 countries. Who knew? And again, why? Need an antidote to the progressive blues? Want some good news about how grassroots folks are rebelling against the corporate powers and winning? Well, here's an easy-to-swallow pill for you, the Hightower Lowdown. Hightower's monthly newsletter will give you the lowdown, even as it lifts you up. It's four pages a month, jam-packed with facts you can use, actions you can take, and Jim's own Texas humor, all for only $15 a year. To become a lowdowner, go to HightowerLowdown.org. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. 9-11 was just one instance of leaders ignoring solid evidence of impending disaster. Richard Clark, who foresaw the tragedy, joins us in an encore segment to talk about this Cassandra syndrome. And we say hello to Richard A. Clark, veteran of 30 years in national security and over a decade in the White House. He's now the CEO of a cybersecurity consulting firm. He's also the author of eight books. The newest with co-author R.P. Eddy is called Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes. Richard Clark, thank you so much for joining us today on AmericasDemocrats.org. No, it's great to be with you. And nice to have you with us as well. You and co-author R.P. Eddy write about Cassandra events in your book. Of course, it's a reference to Greek mythology. Are, are we talking about things like 9-11, the Iraq War, the Great Recession? All of those. Uh, basically, <clears throat> Cassandra in Greek mythology was a woman who was cursed by the gods. She could see the future accurately, see disasters coming, 
but no one would believe her. And a Cassandra event, therefore, in our uh, terminology, is an event where some expert, qualified expert, data-driven expert, saw a disaster coming, but was an outlier. Uh, others didn't agree with her. And she predicted the event, and unfortunately, she was ignored, and the event happened. Now, there have always been prophets of doom. So how does one know when a warning of impending disaster should be heeded? Well, that's what the book is about. How do you tell the prophets of doom, as you say, uh, from the Cassandras? How do you tell <clears throat> the prescient expert who sees something before the other experts do, sees it clearly, from people who just wake up in the middle of the night with a premonition? And the book tries to detail how you should go about doing that. Uh, basically, though, the Cassandras that we found in our case studies, we did seven case studies from the past and seven case studies in the present day and future. The Cassandras we found were people who were internationally recognized experts and who were data-driven and who said to their colleagues, uh, almost all of them said the exact same phrase, I hope I'm wrong. I want to be wrong. Here's my data. Tell me what's wrong with my data. And no one would. You know, our listeners may remember you from some of your outspoken views about the aftermath of 9-11 and the onset of the Iraq war. Were you a Cassandra, a prophet without honor in his own government? Well, that's not for me to say. And, and, and the book is not about me. Uh, people have said that. Uh, I think it's – there are many people before 9-11 who said something like that was going to happen. 9-11, um, I think, he does qualify as a Cassandra event. We're speaking with Richard Clark, CEO of a cybersecurity f firm. Of course, he's an expert in national security. He's spent over a decade in the White House, and he is the author of many books. The latest, with co-author R.P. Eddy, is called Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes. Russia. Is Russia's, Russia's reemergence as a threat one of those Cassandra moments? Because, you know, Mitt Romney even said right in 2012 when he labeled Russia as America's biggest national security danger. I mean, should was that a Cassandra moment? Well, perhaps. Uh, I think there were a number of people who made generalized statements that uh, a resurgent Russia, revanchist Russia uh, could occur. And particularly as it gradually did occur, people were just observing the, uh, the phenomenon. Uh, I think the, the, the person who would qualify as a Cassandra, who we didn't put in the book because it was happening in real time as we were writing the book, uh, with regard to Russia, is Christopher Steele, um, the British intelligence officer, uh, who accurately predicted that the Russians would manipulate our election uh, in order to elect Donald Trump. And he was ignored at the time. And it continues to be ignored, it seems, it, at least from Donald Trump's administration. Well, it's remarkable. You know, any, any other president, uh, and I've worked for a lot of them, Republicans and Democrats, any other president would turn to key staff and say, give me a 10-point plan to stop the Russians from interfering again in the future. And that, that order has never been given. Trump doesn't seem to care if the Russians uh, interfere in the future. Perhaps he wants them to. But there's nothing being done to stop them from manipulating the 2018 election uh, for Congress or the 2020 election for president. And, you know, what scares me about that, too, is that it's in its flat out denial that it's that it has happened at all. And yet you've got what some 17 different agencies, security related agencies that are saying, yes, in fact, it has happened. And, and now we just need to find the depth of it or whatever. Um, that... Well, he seems, he seems to be uh, afraid that if he admits it happened, that somehow it taints his election. Somehow it means that he wasn't fairly elected. Uh, whether or not that's true, there's a way for him to spin that. Um, he could have said, look, I had nothing to do with this. <clears throat> I don't think it had any effect on the outcome of the election, but it's an outrage. Uh, they have another country interfering in our democracy, uh, and I'm going to investigate it. I'm going to find out what happened. I'm going to make sure it never happens again. 
Now, the only reason I can think of why he hasn't said that is he doesn't want it investigated because there may, in fact, have been some collusion. Mm -hmm. Now, as a national security expert, of course, do you think President Obama perhaps made the wrong decisions regarding Russian interference in our elections? You know, that it's so easy uh, to, with hindsight, to criticize decisions people make uh, in the White House as events are unfolding. And I don't know, I've asked myself, uh, what more would I have suggested, uh, given the facts that they had at the time, and given the, the fact that there was an ongoing presidential election in which the president had endorsed one of the candidates, uh, I don't know what more I would have done. I think they, they warned that it was happening. Uh, they warned the states, uh, electoral commissions. Uh, they had the intelligence agencies come out and say it was happening. They twice um, demarched the Russian government and told them to knock it off. Um, I haven't heard anyone suggest specifically what should have been done more and when that should have been done. Mm-hmm. And I read recently that the, the one thing that, that, that President Obama was afraid of was that it was almost like he was interfering in the election himself by trying to, to help out Hillary with this. That doesn't seem like a reasonable reason to not do something about it. Here you've got a foreign country like Russia that clearly is, is meddling uh, electronically in our elections. I, I don't think it matters yeah, who yeah, the candidates are. Sure, You've got to do question, something about it. But you said, do something more about it. My question is, what more would you have done about it that he mm -hmm. didn't already do? Mm -hmm. Fair enough. Was the election of Donald Trump one of these events, like Challenger, the near meltdown of the Japanese reactor, Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme that should have been foreseen and dealt with early? Absolutely. Absolutely. It should have been foreseen. After all, the Russians have been interfering in democracies and democratic elections all over Europe. Uh, and the former Soviet Union, um, they, uh, we knew that they very much disliked uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, there was no reason to assume that they wouldn't get involved. Uh, and yet, like all the other Cassandra events, we didn't think about it in advance because it had never happened before. And this turns out to be the most powerful reason why decision makers don't act on Cassandra event warnings. It's because what is being warned about has never happened before. Mm -hmm. Again, we're speaking with Richard Clark, a veteran of 30 years in national security, over a decade in the White House, CEO of a cybersecurity consulting firm, and of course, author of many books. The latest with co-author R.P. Eddy is called Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes. From a management perspective, isn't one of the problems face, facing decision makers the matter of having too much information rather than not enough? Well, it's a matter of having information from the usual sources uh, and having information that is filtered, um, filtered by staffs. Uh, I was one of those staffs for 10 years in the White House, uh, filtering information going to the president. But with Bill Clinton, every once in a while, he would call me with some information that he got from an external source. And sometimes it would be crazy, <laughs> frankly, but sometimes it would be right on. And I would say to myself, you know, damn it, I should have told him about that. I should have warned him about that. You need a curious mind in the office of the president uh, and in any organization. You need a leader that just doesn't take what comes into the inbox. Are the security agencies completely hamstrung right now because of this president? I don't think so. I think the FBI is demonstrating some independence. Uh, I think the CIA at the operational level, at the rank and file level, uh, is pretty independent, uh, even though it has a political um, former con Republican congressman uh, as its director. Um, I haven't heard of any example yet where he is trying to shape the intelligence. Uh, NSA certainly is doing its thing uh, without regard to political interference. So, no, not yet. Okay. Richard Clark, 
uh, co-author with R.P. Eddy, his latest book, Warnings, Finding Cassandras to Stop Catastrophes, joining us today on americasdemocrats.org. Richard, we do appreciate your time with us today and look forward to having you back again with us soon. Love to do it. Thank you very much. And this is americasdemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Help get our party back to its roots and to success at the ballot box. Make your contribution to keep the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, on the air. And help elect stand-up Democrats. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. This is AmericasDemocrats.org, the weekly podcast for stand-up Democrats. And now Bill Press talks with Joe Cirincione of the Plowshares Fund on Trump's foreign policy. So, Joe, you and I have talked uh, a a lot here on the program about the Iran nuclear deal and how important it is. And one part of the deal is that every, what, 60 days, 90 days, the president has to certify. Yes. And then, so basically, we're going to stay in the deal. Donald Trump refusing to do so last week and sending the deal to Congress, to the Senate, for an uncertain fate. What does that mean? What are the implications of that? This is the most significant foreign policy decision of the Trump presidency so far. It has far-reaching implications. It has everybody worried. I just spent an evening at at, at Georgetown gathering yesterday in a dinner meeting filled with 40 experts discussing this from uh, the Obama administration, outside the administration, uh, discussing this. Everybody is deeply worried for for two reasons. One, he's threatening to leave the deal. What he did on Friday didn't quite do it. It's just as an internal matter. He he didn't certify that Iran is in compliance, even though everyone agrees outside the administration that they are. Inside the man. Tillerson. Yes. The entire national security intelligence team recommended certifying because Iran is complying. The deal works. It rolled back and froze Iran's nuclear program. So number one, the, the, the concern is that if the U.S. continues down this path with Senate help, basically what Trump did was open the door for the Senate by not certifying Iran mm-hmm. compliance. He opens up a 60-day legislative window where the Senate can offer legislation to reimpose sanctions. Tom Cotton is taking full advantage in an apparently coordinated effort to offer legislation that would actually kill the deal. You kill the deal, what that means is the U.S. is out of the deal and the Iranians are then free to restart their program if they want. The, the sanction regime collapses because it's all built on international cooperation. And you could see Iran kick out the inspectors and restart their program. That's problem number one. Problem number two, this opens up a huge breach in the American alliance system. The Europeans are furious. They've been issuing statements from the leadership on down, joint statements yeah. from the leaders of France and Germany, the United Kingdom, for example. The German foreign minister just on Saturday says this is, this is you know, a terrible decision because they this is a multilateral deal. This is not U.S.-Iran. This is a U.N. Security Council resolution. All the nations of the world are vested in this because it solved this problem that threatened a war. So you're breaching uh, an already frayed American alliance. Al- alliance sacrifice and this is what McCain is referring to in part even though he's critical of the deal sacrificing American leadership for this nationalism and third and this is probably the worst is that if Iran in fact does start its program up again then you don't have sanctions you don't have restrictions so what are you left with if you want to stop the program military force Mm -hmm. so this puts us on the path to war again echoing Senator Bob Corker's statement that Trump is putting us on the path to World War III. So the argument that I've heard uh, is, uh, at, at some people in, in the administration, well, and Donald Trump himself, yeah, well, they may be, uh, they may be, it may be complying with this deal, but meanwhile, they're yeah. still giving money to Hezbollah. Meanwhile, they're still da da da, and maybe they they're in cahoots right. with North Korea. They're doing this other bad stuff, right? So they're not right. in compliance with the spirit of yeah. the deal. A deal, a decision was made very early on in the United States and in Iran and in Europe that you couldn't negotiate all the issues at once. There was no possibility of a grand bargain. So you had to take the most serious. What was that? Nuclear weapons. Whatever else Iran does, 
not having the threat of nuclear weapons makes it easier to deal with those things. So let's take this most difficult issue, the one that was threatening war. Remember, six years ago in this Capitol, we were talking about when we were going to attack Iran, not, not if. Mm -hmm. So you remove that. It does, so that's, it, that's all it does. But then it lets you deal with these other issues. You still have all the other tools available, all the other a avenues that you have. This idea of the spirit of a deal is a, is a complete fabrication. There is no such thing. Maybe some hopes that this could lead to other breakthroughs, but it was never part of the bargain. Well, it made me think about the arms deals that Ronald Reagan mm. or George Bush, either the Bushes or Bill Clinton or Barack Obama signed with either the Soviet Union or Russia, right? There were a lot of things oh, sure. wrong with with the Soviet Union or with Russia, other things wrong at that time, but they didn't say, no, this deal has to include every single problem that we have with Russia. No, those deals were focused on nuclear arms. We right? started detente with the Soviet Union under Richard Nixon when the Soviets were arming the North Vietnamese and the North Vietnamese were killing 100 or more U.S. soldiers a week. So that's the way you distinguish and you, you prioritize your threats, you prioritize your problems. And you focus. And, and you focus. Yeah. Um, so um, if I'm Kim Jong-un, okay, now this mm. is kind of tough, but it seems to me, and I'm, uh, yes. and I'm looking, okay, they want me to give up my nuclear weapons. Now let's see what's happened to other countries that have done this. Okay, so Muammar Gaddafi gave up his nuclear weapons. Mm. Yeah, he ended up in a sewer pipe, and when he got in trouble, what did we do? We helped the people who were trying to overthrow him. Okay. Okay, that's one. Two, Iran. They give up their nuclear weapons. And what are they doing to Iran? They're screwing Iran. So why should I give up mine? And Saddam Hussein, who gave up his Saddam programs Hussein. in 1991. Yeah, right, Remember, this a... was after the first war. It's clear there were yeah. no WMD in Iraq. That was a right. complete lie. And the same people who lied about that are also lying about Iran now, trying to get us to go mm -hmm. back to a military conflict. So this is the North Korean view. If you give up your weapons, America will kill you. But, so why should you give up your weapons? You'd be I mean, foolish. They've got the they've got <laughs> yes. They have evidence to support that. <laughs> it happens to be yeah. true. Exactly. So that means we have a huge hurdle to overcome. And instead of trying to overcome that, uh, he's making it worse. Which is why what he's doing on Iran ripples into the possibility. Some say it makes it now impossible to negotiate an agreement with North Korea. I'm not quite there yet, but it certainly makes it much more difficult. But it does. It also uh, don't don't we have to accept uh, moving to North Korea? Really, is that North Korea is now a nuclear power? You have to recognize the reality of that, but you don't have to do it sort of de jour. You don't have to recognize them as a nuclear weapon state. I think that's a step too far, and doing so it increases the possibility that South Korea, Japan would decide that they want to be a nuclear weapon state too. So there's real reasons why you don't want to say that. But you have to recognize that they have a program and they're not going to give it up at this point. So you can't go into negotiations whose purpose is the complete elimination okay. uh, in the near term of North Korea's nuclear program. All right. So you keep using the word negotiations, right? Yes. What, what do you do in a situation where Donald Trump has told the Secretary of State no yeah. more negotiations? Nikki Haley has said, right. you know, whatever, in so many different ways. Yes. We're, it, we're, we're just, we're not talking anymore. And Donald Trump telling Rex Tillerson, you're wasting your time, Rex. Right. Well, Nikki Haley is the neocon secretary of state. She's channeling that movement to almost directly, seeing it as her path to secretary of state and a possible presidential bid mm -hmm. soon, perhaps. So that's what yeah. Nikki Haley's game is. Um, President uh, Trump says, as usual, everything, you know, just. A few days ago, he said, I'm not ruling out negotiations, but wait a minute, I thought you just did rule out negotiations. So it's, this, is, of course, is another part of the problem, the, the unsteady nature of the presidency, um, but his willingness to talk, say anything at any time. Aren't negotiations the only true path? Yes. You do not have a military option, even though the people keep talking about that, and some are flirting with it. There is increasing talk about this in the administration. So, yes, there is a real chance we could initiate military action, but that is not that would lead to a devastating war unlike anything we've seen since the end of the Korean War. Uh, South you, Korea, right in, the, right in the... Oh, absolutely. Oh, we're talking about millions of deaths. We're talking about World War II-style warfare, not counterinsurgency, not surgical strikes. This is 
World War II, mm-hmm. in the mud, conventional war, you know, th- tens of thousands of people dying per hour. That, so that's, that's why there is no real military option. The, the second possibility, China will take care of it for us, will somehow strangle North Korea. That's not going to happen. Yeah, right. They don't want to see it destabilized. They keep pushing for negotiations. There is a third option, which is you sort of muddle through, that you don't do negotiations, you don't do anything, that you basically accept North Korea as a state. Well, muddle and, through, but meanwhile, then, they, they're able to, to, to complete phase three, yes. which is putting this nuclear weapon they have on top of the long-range missile. Yes. And, you know... What are the chances that uh, one of them said the other day, one of their leaders that, you know, w- w- nuclear war could happen in, you know, within weeks or something like that? I mean, what are the chances that they might do something crazy like lava missile the West Coast of the what United States? What almost everyone fears is not a U.S. first strike, although I would, that's not out, off the table. Yeah, right, not under, not with this president. And they, and they really don't fear so much a North Korean first strike. They know hmm. what would happen next. You know, yeah. they, deterrence is alive and well. What you fear is a stumbling into war, that something cascades, a, a, something happens, and it, it escalates uh, out of control. Remember, this is an area where the North Koreans have done stupid things in the past, like shoot down American surveillance planes, killing 31 mm-hmm. people, 1969. Shoot down a U.S. reconnaissance helicopter, 1994, killing an American, holding another American for, for uh, 13 days, lobbing artillery shells into a South Korean island just a couple of years ago, killing some South Koreans there. So they do do those things, and the risk is we do something provocative, they respond, we respond, it escalates out of control, and pretty soon we're actually shooting uh, at, at each other, and the war begins. That's all for americasdemocrats.org. Thank you to all who made today's show possible. John Prados, Richard Clark, and the entire Bill Press team. And thank you for listening. If you liked what you heard, please get involved in our efforts to keep this show going and to elect Democrats who are bringing the party back to its roots. Go to americasdemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page. And be sure to find 21st Century Democrats on Facebook. For AmericasDemocrats.org, I'm your host, Jim Cuddy. We want you to sit back and listen, but we need you to stand up and fight. Join us. Support the AmericasDemocrats.org podcast, a project of 21st Century Democrats, and help elect Democrats who will stand up for democratic principles with your contribution today. Go to AmericasDemocrats.org and click on Donate at the top of the page.